So, I don't know. It's one of those days today that I'm thinking we just skip the box. Should we skip the box today? All right, kids, come on down. Bring that box down. Man, if, you, if I could have had a camera and took the picture of y'all's face at that point, there's a little more room up here, isn't there? Yeah, there's something special happening tonight that you all can come to, but I'm not going to tell you about it because Ken's going to talk about it later, but I'm going to be here. All right, let's see what we got. I'm, I'm up here. There we go. All right. So this is our box. Each week, we get to see what's inside the box. The speaker doesn't get to know what's inside the box. And this is a beautiful tradition for us to have some fun and to see what God has in store for us. And no more live animals, which is good. We're okay with that. So let's see what's inside. Oh, oh, dude, these are Playmobiles, right? Playmobile? Do you know, I always wanted these as kids, but they were only ever in school. Like, you couldn't get a hold of these at home, and now you get them at home, right? Like, cool, cool. All right, anyway, sorry, I'm having a moment. So here's the thing. By the way, did you know what I was going to preach on this morning? You, you knew what I'm preaching on this morning? <laughs> you do? Are you sure? Okay, because this plays perfect into our sermon. Are these actual humans? No. But are they made in the image of a human? Do they look like a human? They have human characteristics, right? They've got arms and legs, and there's a lot about them that makes them look like humans, but they're not humans, right? This morning, we're going to talk about how we are made in the image of God. We're not God but we're, we have a lot of his qualities. And there's things about God that we have instilled in us. So just like these Playmobiles, they aren't humans. They don't have a chance to reason. They don't walk around on their own. Boy, wouldn't that be creepy if you woke up one morning and your toys started like roaming around your bedroom, right? How crazy. But that's the idea, right? These are made in the image of humans. So this morning, we're gonna talk about how we are made in the image of God and how amazing that is. All right? So thank you. We're going to hear all about that in Genesis now. Who would like the box? You haven't had the box for a while, have you? It's been a while. All right. I will let my daughter have the box, even though I am preaching next week, so you better be nice. All right. There you go. You guys can go. Thank you very much. Good job. I know. I won't know what it is. I will not know what it is next week. She will keep it secret for sure. For sure. So the image of God, and this is a one-off sermon. This isn't part of a series or anything. It's a little break. I have been wanting to teach this for a while. I've been studying this in my seminary, um, specifically around Christian ethics um, and the image of God. But to this morning, we're just going to be talking about this concept of the image of God. And I'm going to ask for a little leeway this morning. So if you are an armchair quarterback and you like to critique my sermons on your lunchtime with your family or if there or any of that kind of thing, I ask that you just throw this out and say we're just having a little fun this morning in conversation. And I want you to pretend if you can for a moment that it's just me and you in the room. And I have come to you personally and said I have some stuff to tell you. I want us to pretend that you're not sitting with anybody today because I don't want this to be a group thing. I want you to at least try to gather something personal out of this because this study of Imago Dei, the image of God, I started studying it years ago because it pained me on how I was treating myself. That if I am made in the image of God, how I was handling my life and my affairs and who I was as a human being, I did not think I was honoring that image. And it's been a journey for me in life wrestling with that. And that could be a whole other sermon to talk about that. But I share that with you because I want you to understand this is a very um, personal topic for me, 
But I'm not going to really talk about me in it in the sense of like my personal opinions of it or anything. I just want to like express this beauty that we are in the made of the image of God. So let's look at Scripture first. So this, this concept of the image of God, we see it first play out in Genesis. And God said, let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every moving thing that moves upon the earth. So God created humankind in his. Okay, so right there we see it. We see this in our image. Genesis 5, 1 to 3. This is the record of the generations of Adam. When God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them, and he called them their name, humankind. When they were created, and when Adam had lived 100, okay, so we see it again. Genesis 9, 6. As for the one shedding the blood of humankind, by humankind his blood shall be shed. For God made humankind in his own image. Again, we see this. This concept that we are in the image of God. Now, let's look at some New Testament. Romans 8, 29. Because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, image of God, so that he should be the firstborn among many brothers. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. That you take off, according to your former way of life, the old man who is being destroyed according to deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man in accordance with God, who is created in righteousness and holiness from the truth? Again, who is created in righteousness and holiness from the truth? The image of God, the Imago Dei. Colossians 3, 9 to 11. Do not lie to one another because you have taken off the old man together with his deeds and have put on the new man that is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, Imago Dei where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian. And sorry, parents, you might have to explain circumcision later. And Hebrew 1.3, who is the radiance of his glory and the representation of his essence, sustaining all things by the word of power. When he had made purification for sins through him, he sat down the right hand of man, right hand of the majesty on high. Representation of his essence. Imago Dei. Think about it. You and me were made in an image of God. That means we have something about God in us. So I'd like to go over some observations here. Some observations about these scriptures. And just look at these for a moment. So the image of God is gender neutral. That means not just man, it's man and woman. We saw that there that he made humankind. The image of God as a phrase is applied only to humans. Therefore, humanity is to be distinguished from the rest of earthly creation. Okay, so for those that are out there that say that we're like animals, we might have some qualities. We might be considered mammals from a scientific factor standpoint, but at the end of the day, humans are set apart. God made us separately from the rest of creation. We are not trees. We're not fish, we're not rocks, we are completely separate. Humanity is in some way like God. The copy is like the original creator in some way. Now that gets interesting, right? Because if God made us like him, then that means that we have attributes of God in us as we were designed, created, and built. That means you and I have the essence of God in how he designed us, the way he made our brains, the way he made our attitudes, our emotions. Now, this is interesting. Throughout Scripture, there is no hint that humanity grows into the image or develops the image. There is no potential image. Whatever the image of God means, it is by definition inseparable from the human species. So in other words, it's not like you start out as a baby and then by the time you hit 90, You've arrived at being in the image of God. No, you start out there. That also means every human being is born in the image of God. Every human being. 
from birth. Now that gets interesting too. Because that means that no matter how you come out of the womb, you are in the image of God. These characteristics are here with us. Nothing at all ever suggests that the image has been or can be bestowed incrementally or partially. So that means when a human exists on this earth, they are not a partial image of God. So we cannot therefore devalue someone because they're less in the image. Humanity is made the steward master of creation. The reverse is not the case. And what that means is, is that creation is not here to manage us. We are here to manage creation. It's part of who we are. The imaging vocabulary is linked to childbearing. Humans after Adam and Eve are not direct creations of God, but Genesis 9, 6 recognizes later humans as being in God's image. So what this means is that even though God did not physically take the earth and form you or grab a rib from your spouse and make you, the childbearing process is the passing on of the image of God. And we are still made in that likeness. And the image of God describes with language of plurality. Let us make in our image. And that plurality is interesting because I wonder who God is still talking to. I always wonder, is it the angels? Is it other beings within the heavenly realms? That's a huge, wide, vast mystery. I'm not going there this morning. But what I could say is this. I believe that God is so big and so powerful and so amazing that our minds can keep trying to wrap our heads around him and we'll never get there. But the fact that I myself and you too have wanted to try and engage this means that there is this thing inside of us, this image of God that creates this yearning for us. You know, it's interesting when you look at like... When we look at what we consider a standard for human behavior, we look at what we consider as shelter, food, safe place to live. These are the things that as a mandatory reporter, I would report on. If there is a family that is, not, that is neglectful of their children, I would report that. If there is abuse going on in a home because these certain things, there's not safe, there's not food, there's not shelter. And what's interesting is we look at these basic needs that we consider for human beings, these were the same basic needs that were started in the Garden of Eden. And I find it interesting that as an image of God, these are things that we want for others too. Humans being in the image of God makes us co-creators in the world and our capacity to love and love God in profound ways. I love this image the hardscapes of things and the beauty of color, the gears churning and creativity. I think, now, I will, I, will, I will say this. You are welcome to sit down with me and tell me that I'm wrong on this statement. And I would love to have that conversation. So I'm inviting anyone that would like to engage this topic. I believe that humanity, because we are created in the image of God and has the capacity to love, that we can fix the world's problems through the divine love that has been shown through us and then spread out into the world. I believe that. I believe that is the hope of Jesus, that through that love that is transcended to us, that I have received from God, that when I exercise that out in the world through creative processes, and creative things to get creative on fixing issues and working on problems and being in people's lives, stuff will happen. I believe that is why Jesus walked this earth, that we went through the Holy Week, and that we saw this so that we have an example of how to be on this earth. And I believe that you and I have gotten lazy and we lack our creativity from the divine to solve what is happening around us. I believe that God has gifted us as humans 
with this power to imagine and to have an imagination to create beautiful things that most of the time we put it on the shelf and we ignore the world because it's somebody else's problem. And that, I think, is us skipping over the fact that we are created in the image of God. Now, this is interesting. Love was part of the image of God, not morality. And I want to share this with you because it's interesting if you think about it, right? Adam and Eve were put on the earth first, and they were said to what? One thing they weren't allowed to do. What? What weren't they supposed to do? Right? Eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, the image of God is pureness, purely good. When created... And, and we know, right, when something's good, we know it. But when they ate of the fruit, this reality of death has started, this reality that there's going to be bad stuff, and there's this reality that we now know what is good and evil. But the fact is that when God created us, in his image, in the essence, was not for us to be doing bad things, to creating atrocities towards other people. No. The point was, in the essence, there was a relationship and Adam and Eve saw that relationship. They were able to be a part of that. And we see this as God showed his love to Adam and Eve. He walked in the garden with them. There was this engagement with them. Matter of fact, Adam and Eve knew they were husband and wife. There were these things that were built into us that we naturally have the capacity to love. Matter of fact, when a baby comes out of the womb... It wants to be loved, and a healthy human being would want to love their child back, correct? It's, it's that. It's part of that. Matter of fact, most people, unless you've been traumatized in your life, you bring a baby into a room, and I promise you, most people, women especially, go, oh, there's the baby. And then this really weird thing happens. They actually want to hold it. Because there's something in us when we see a newborn. There's cherish. There's new life. There's all these things that go with it. But part of the image that God has stamped upon us is to have a fervence for life. And the innocence of a baby is there. And we acknowledge that. And we love that. When we bring children up front and they gather, I love that moment when the kids come up because I see this life, this, 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 this energy, this beautiful thing that happens when kids are engaging with the Father. And see, I believe that we need to understand that our image that God made us with has this capacity to love in ways that God has shown us. But the fact is still... Adam and Eve ate from the tree. And we have this reality of good and evil. We have this reality of life and death. We understand a bit more now what it feels like not to be loved. I even want to venture to say this morning that this is love and this is not love. That I believe that when we feel and engage in situations and relationships that are very negative, there is not a loving spirit behind it. When I have been in a disagreement with someone and they are yelling back at me, I do not take yelling at me and being mad at me as a loving act. Right? Make sense? See, we have this discernment ability. We understand these things. And see, as the image of God has been pressed upon us, we have this capacity then to explain and to teach others a difference in the way of the world. But the reality too is, is that as we look at this good and evil and this concept of love and not love, we also have spiritual components that go with this too. And see, this is where it really gets deep for me because humankind are not angels. Remember, demons are turned angels from God. So if we have this other reality, as we see through Scripture, the angels play these roles, there is this concept that it's not just us on earth, but there's this whole spiritual side of the world that just really gets explosive. I'm not going there today. I'm not going to get into whether angels are in the made of the image of God or not. I don't believe they are. I think it's a whole separate category. But 
I just want to acknowledge, though, that when we pray, there's bigger things happening around us than just our humankind world. And I think it's also important for us to realize that as we are made in this image of God, that we have to remember there is a tension in this world from a spiritual aspect that we play a part of here on earth. And I think sometimes we think so highly of ourselves. I'll just say this. I know for me, I think so highly of myself that there are days that the rest of the world doesn't exist because it's all about me. And I don't want to acknowledge sometimes that this is going on because that means I actually have value. And there's some days I don't want to be valuable and I don't want to be in the image of God because I don't want to deal with any of this. But when we look at Genesis, it does say that we're here to be caretakers of this earth. So that means we are built for something more and we're not supposed to be alone and not just be self-absorbed. I know, a beautiful picture of sunrise, right? Or a sunset. The fact is, humanity has this ability to be so creative. Matter of fact, we have the ability to be so creative that the image of God is being a co-creator with him. There's so much. I mean, look around this room for a moment. The concept of power is involved with our lighting. There's lights here. There's power to a camera that is broadcasting this to people online. There are power that runs all throughout to give our audio system so you can hear me well. You woke up this morning to an alarm clock. Power is part of our world. The lights and electric are everywhere. And heaven forbid, if the power goes out in the dead of summer, we're done. Air conditioning is a huge piece of our world. And see, this reality of being able, as as humans, to get down into the microscopic world and to be able to split, and I'm not a nuclear physicist, so if I say all the terms wrong, I'm just letting you know I'm just winging it right now in my brain. Because... My understanding is there's this splitting of atoms and they explode out and it creates this massive amount of energy that is then produced out through this nuclear power plant and is able to do amazing things and run stuff for us. It's amazing to me. It's amazing that we have doctors and physicians that understand how to go inside of us. It is amazing to me that there are construction workers that know how to build big buildings. It amazes me time and time again as I look at humans and how they create something. I mean, look at the pews you're sitting on right now. The ornateness to them, the solidness of the wood. Someone had to understand what was the right spot to put things. And you sit on them week after week after week, and they don't break. And that was a human that created that. Vehicles and just the intensity that goes in, the vehicle running. I mean, I could go on and on and on about human creativity, but all that is because we're in the image of God. And we can do amazing things, but here's the fact, and this is the part that bothers me, we can do that. And we can take that same technology, that beautiful thing that gives us air conditioning, and we can gather in a large room together and not worry about the elements, but yet we have the capability of bombs that will blow up cities irregardless that they're made in the image of God. And that we have the capacity to be so heinous towards humans, whether it's with technology like this, of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, or just the way we creatively use our words to cut someone else down and make them feel small. I have watched humans in my own life, and myself included, have the creativity to do such horrible things to people and to be villains in situations that it aches me. Because as a pastor, I spend a good chunk of my days helping people heal or repent from villainous activities that they have been a part of in someone's creative mind to do harm to others. Church, that bothers me. Does it bother you? Does it bother you that that, that we as humans can just do horrible things like this? And we can come up with all the reasons, well, they had a bad upbringing or this and that. We can always come down with all the excuses on why and the reasons why, but at the end of the day, because we're made in the image of God, we have this ability 
to just do more. And when we go into Scripture and when we read his word, we can start to understand these things. See, God gave us Scripture to not just understand morality as what's right and wrong, but it's more about how do we unlock and keep chasing after the image of God in us. I believe that when we read the Bible and we read it with the lens that we are creating the image of God, it unlocks more for us on how to have a more amazing life than what we have now. You pick a topic, there's something in the Bible about it or at least gives you a foundation to build off of. I also know this. I know a lot of people that study the Bible. I know a lot of people that memorize verses. I know a lot of people that when you, they talk about the Bible, they know it inside and out. But ask them to go love someone that they don't know, or that they don't like their lifestyle or anything like that and how to be in their world and be in relationship with them and get creative on how to engage them, forget about it. Ain't happening. Yeah, you know, I give Lil Delt credit. This morning, he's down in Philadelphia hanging out with a poli- bunch of police bikers as they're having their first ever blessing for the riding year. Now, I know Lowell <laughs> prays for and is around and engages with a lot of people that don't think like him. And yet he keeps showing up and loving on them. And that amazes me because It's those types of acts, it's those types of moments when we step out of our spaces and we do these creative things, these imaginative things to love other people, when we take the scriptures and we live them out, it becomes more than just a study. Honestly, I don't care if you've memorized the whole Bible, and if you don't put it to practice in your daily life, it means nothing. I've been there. I studied plenty of things, and I look at them, ooh, I'm not going to get into that. That's too hard. I don't know if I'm called to that, God. You see, again, the reality is there's death in life. The image of God in us also gets painted sometimes and messy. And I believe it is a practice for us to spend time in repentance. And repentance is not just asking for forgiveness. It is actually turning your ways. But I think many of us, we have to start repenting more often and turning our ways and changing them. Because the fact is, there's choices that people make in my life that have affected me forever because they weren't fulfilling the image of God that they have. And I think, folks, that, that when we bump into other humans and they're not chasing after the image of God in them, trying to be as best as they can be, that throws mud on us. You pick it. Any any person that's ever wronged you, that put you into this feeling here, where you've experienced this side of life, it it taints you. It puts mud on you. If you can imagine yourself as this beautiful portrait, and when you sin against others or they sin against you, you get covered in this mud. And there's this constant practice of being washed. So I've now presented you with all this stuff about chasing after the image of God. I've given you all this, what I would consider theory or background knowledge. So now I want to give you application. I don't want you to walk away from here just having a good topic. I want to share with you what I believe is how God made us to be. Does anybody know what this is? It took me a while to figure it out. Anybody? It's a quilt wrapped around a tree. This is called yarn bombing. It is something that's going on in different cities where people are taking crocheting, quilting, and wrapping them around trees to be artistic. I don't know. It's what people are doing. But it's interesting. Look it up. It's fascinating what people are doing in quilting. Kit Holmes, have you ever wrapped a quilt around a tree before? Not recently, okay, there you go. But creativity. Donald Miller in his book, Hero on a Mission, I loved what he said. He said, humans are built for community, creativity, art, and nature. 
And that when we put those three things together, that we are able to experience love. And it is our way of seeing the image of God in us. Because God built us in community, man and woman. He built us to be creative. And he built us right in nature. Matter of fact, you don't need a building to live. You could live right out on the land. God made us to live in creation. And when you chase after community, creativity, art, and nature, and creativity could be a lot of different things, music, the arts, reading, poetry, you you pick it. But if you start to chase after those three things and look for God in those spaces, you will see amazing things start to happen in your life. It is fascinating to me the times when I am intentional about community and art and nature in my spaces and when I include them in it and I look for God in those spaces and I ask the Holy Spirit to show his presence and I'm a part of all those things, it is amazing the stories that come out of that. So I have one for you. I have such a mind-blowing miracle story for you this morning, you will all walk away and not believe it. And it's stupid. It is such a stupid little story, but I need to share it with you. Because I want to explain to you the intricacies of this. So there's a friend of mine, her name is Megan. She's actually played here one time for worship at our outdoor service. Megan and I are good friends. She's like my other little sister. We just, we have a blast together. We giggle, we laugh. She's friends of our family. She's just a good gal overall. On Wednesday, we were having a discussion about where she wants to be in the future of her life. And she said, Scott, I want to be a flight medic someday. I would love to be able to fly over a wilderness area and help save someone's life. Because if they wanted to be out in nature and they made a mistake, I I want them to live through it. Because she's a huge hiker and loves to be in nature. Okay, cool. Well, do you know anyone that's a flight medic? Nope, I don't. Okay. Well, I think that's the step is we have to find somebody that knows somebody that's a flight medic. Because if you find that out, then maybe you could get somewhere and you could learn and be mentored. She's like, I agree. So later on that afternoon, I'm at the bike shop. And when I'm at the shop, this guy comes in, we're selling him a bike, blah, blah, blah. I said, sir, do you need a helmet? He's like, yeah, I do. I said, my flight helmet is an extra large. I said, okay. In the back of my head, I'm like, I've never had anyone in the bike shop tell me that their flight helmet is an extra large. So I grabbed the helmet, I pulled it out, handed it to him, puts it on, and I look at his jacket because I wasn't paying attention to his jacket at all because I was trying to help him find a bike. Excuse me, sir, it says on your shoulder that you're a flight medic. Is this true? Yes, it is. Why? I would like you to be part of a crazy story of my life, and I'd like you to be a part of that. Are you okay with that? Uh, I think so. Sure. I said, okay, I would like to blow your mind right now. So I told him the whole story about my breakfast. He looks at me and goes, I'd love to meet your friend, Megan. Matter of fact, I'd love to take her up on a flight crew. And matter of fact, I'd love to teach her how she can become a flight medic. I'd be happy to do that. I can't make that stuff up. But see, watch. Because I had community with Megan, because Megan and I spent a lot of time out in nature, and we've done a lot of art together. We had this relationship that was formed, that was close, and that we look for God in our spaces. And because of the bike shop being in the community, and there's a lot of creative space in the bike shop, and the point of bikes is to be out in nature, when we start looking for God in those spaces, he shows up. Church, I believe we need to be praying together in relationship together at a spiritual level more than what we are now. And as individuals, if you do not have spiritual connection with other human beings, if you do not find community, if you're not having creative spaces in your world, If you're not getting out in nature, we need to talk. You'll be hearing more over this next month in May as we are investing in life-on-life groups. You're going to be hearing more about some study spaces that I'm going to be creating for you to engage with with me on deeper topics. I am crying out to the Lord, and I'm asking you to pray with me on this, that there will be this knitting that happens with us as a church, that it's not just about Janie went in for her left thyroid knee surgery, whatever surgery you want to call it. It's not that someone just passed away and we step up and care, but what happens when we have these relationships 
that are so knit spiritually that we can talk about it and then we can see each other in the image of God that when we step out into the world, people are looking at us because we're so peculiar that we're so different, but yet when they smell chocolate chip cookies and that beautiful feel of that, that sweet aroma, they see it in us as well. Because church... All I know is this, when I keep trying to be like Jesus, good stuff happens. When I try not to be like Jesus, bad stuff happens. That's all I know. Every time in my own humanness, they don't take time to acknowledge I'm part of the image of God, things go bad. And when I strive to go after the image of God, I'm not saying that things aren't harder, but there's usually good that comes out of it. So I'm asking you to start praying, not just by yourself, but grab someone else. You'll be hearing about a date in May that we'll have another day of prayer here. And I want us as a church to start thinking of what does it mean to not just care about each other to go do our favorite hobby together, but what does it mean for us to pray with each other? to be supporting each other, to have these relationships that we don't feel alone, that we feel like we're part of this beautiful thing called the image of God. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in us. Lord, I thank you that you made us like you, that we have these things inside of us that want to create, that we want to see the world, that when we step outside, we love a nice sunny day, that, Lord, you built these pieces of us that when we are outside, stuff happens in us, Lord, that we get better, that we feel better mentally and physically. And, Lord, you've connected us with nature. God, I thank you for the ability to create, to do amazing things. Lord, I thank you for whoever thought of making this foyer, I mean, this, this sanctuary, Lord, and the foyer and the fellowship hall and all the creativity that went into building this building, Lord. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for the community, the people are in this room and the faces that I see, the new and those that I've seen for a while. Lord, I thank you for this ability as humans for us to build community, that we can meet strangers, and then through these things of relationship and conversation, Lord, that we can do amazing things through our relationships. And God, I thank you for Wednesday and just showing up in that very odd way that I have no clue how you do it, but you just make me stand back and go, wow. So God, I ask that this week you help us to have wow stories. Lord, help us to see you more in our communities and our creativity and in nature. And Lord, thank you for giving us your image. Lord, thank you for making us like you. In your awesome name, amen.